whenever you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of potential, you know, tax deductions from things like cost segregation, you can use that to potentially offset your income. That's like right up my alley of like, you know, what I'm very familiar with. Uh, I've studied the passive activity loss audit technique guide and like all the different IRS publications they have out there. So that's just like, there's all, all different niches. And I just happen to really, I like the, the, the real estate. I wanted to start off first about, I found out that you played college baseball, which I'm fascinated. Yeah. I really love interviewing guys that have been athletes. I've had some professional, you know, NFL football players and, I just really enjoy talking to athletes. So I just wanted to hear just a little bit about maybe the lessons that you learned playing both high school, college baseball, and how you've applied those lessons to what you're doing now. Like how has that impacted your life and career? Yeah, man. No, no, no. That's, that's a, that's a really good question, man. Uh, I mean, cause there, there's like several lessons that, that I would have learned, right? You know, you gotta learn how to be a good teammate. And, and work together with, you know, to, you know, with a team to achieve a common goal. Like, you know, that's probably one. And, and that really applies to, to business now. But some of the things that, you know, some of the other things. So like in baseball, if you are a pitcher, you know, you're going to give up a bomb that, that just comes at the wrong time. You may lose the game. Or you may be a hitter uh, that, that goes, oh, for his next 20 at bats. Or maybe you're the one that strikes out and ends the game with a strikeout, right? You have to come with that humility. And I think that was something that, that, that I also learned is, you know, baseball is definitely a very humbling sport and you have to, you know, take that humility and apply it to business. But probably the biggest lesson I learned was, you know, in, 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 in college baseball, yeah, you have freaks of nature and you have guys that are just like, you know, unbelievably talented athletes, but the broad majority of people, right. Are all, you know, once when you get to that college level and even like you go to the next level, Everyone is good at that point. But the thing that really separates the good from the great is who makes the less fundamental mistakes, right? You know, it's the fundamentals that, that really separate the good from the great. And, you know, yeah, you can make the, the diving play, that you can be, you know, super fast, super strong. But if you can fundamentally be very sound um, and try to make as few mistakes fundamentally as possible, you will see success. And, and that, that lesson right there is really transferred over to wealth for, for life and just business in general. I interviewed a guy named Chris Kerner, who's on Twitter. That's how you and I got connected was, was yeah. Twitter. But, but Chris had a post where he talked about his preference in hiring people, specifically salespeople, were college athletes, D1 athletes. He's like, by far, those are the best guys to hire. Can you speak to that a little bit? Like why that is, you think? Oh man, you know, uh, so, so I'm not too sure, you know, scientifically what the reasoning will be behind, but I do know that whenever you, uh, you know, are, are involved in any type of like college athletic sport or, you know, you're and a lot of college, college athletes can attest to this, but you have to be very disciplined and you have to be very meticulous with your time. So, right? you know, constantly throughout the day, you got to go to class. Then you got to go to workouts. Then you got to go to practice. Then you know, at my school, where they you know the, the the freshmen, sophomores, and juniors who didn't have a certain GPA, you had to go to study hall, right? So you learn. You had to learn how to use your time wisely uh, and use it to, to to your most. And you have to be multi skilled, right? You can't just only be a good athlete. And if you don't, you know, get the grades. You know, you're not going to be playing, right? So, uh, you know, that would be probably my my reasoning behind it. I'm not too sure if that's really what it is, but. Um, yeah, you know, that was that was something that I learned whenever I was younger was, was time management. And, um, you know, I feel like that transfer is over not just to sales, but just business and life in general. You know, that, that's another great skill that people need to learn how to have. It's just time management, using their time wisely, focus on your strengths and outsource your weaknesses. I like that. My wife, I told you, is a um, therapist and one of her favorite books is a book called Grit. And it's, okay. I think that's, that's another factor is just athletes develop grit. They, they develop perseverance and, you know, like you said, getting the fundamentals down and just sticking to it and just gr learning to grind is like such a big part of success. And yeah. it doesn't matter what it is. Having that, having that competitive nature and just like that killer instinct. Yeah, no, yeah. a lot of, uh, yeah. And if you're, if you're an athlete, you know, you definitely have that, 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 that instinct, you know, I call it, I call it the killer instinct. I'm not actually mean killer. Right. But I'm talking yeah, about just yeah. like that competitiveness to always want to win. Yeah. The, uh, NCAA basketball tournaments going on now as we're recording this. Yeah. And I, I just love to watch the athletes, both the men and the women, just like 
their drive. And I, I just, yeah. I think it's like such a fascinating sporting event to watch. I always feel like it's more tested, like sometimes, you know, with the professionals, right? You know, once oh. the money gets involved, we start, now granted, you know, college athletes are getting paid for like their endorsements and stuff now, but it's still a little different, man. I feel like you got more to prove whenever you're still a college athlete versus, you know, now you're a multimillionaire professional athlete. Yeah, no doubt. I want to talk a little bit about, so you're, you're playing baseball in college. When did money and investing and all of that, like, what are your, some of your first memories of that? Man, How did that, that's that a interest really good question. Out? That's a really good question. So, um, you know, growing up, we didn't really talk too much about like, I mean, we talked about budgeting, right? You know, it was more, more very basic budgeting, not really too much on investing. But when I went to school, uh, so I studied uh, business and I was in, the, you know, there, I studied management, uh, business finance, I'm studying accounting, marketing. You know, I, I, it was, it was pretty general broad because not only did I go, um, so I, I, I majored in management. I minored in finance and accounting, and then I went and got an MBA. Uh, so I, I, I was in a school, you know, constantly around business and money. So, it, but, but it was funny because back then when I was in school, I was just trying to get good grades, right? You know, I, I kind of like got the hang of like how this thing was supposed to work and you know, so I could, I can make good grades, but it wasn't until I got my first corporate America job. That's whenever it's finally all hit and I'm starting to get paychecks and I have a 401k and, you know, I have to pay taxes and, you know, all this other stuff. That's when it's like, oh, this is what is really going on. Right. So it was that experience that really finally like, like tipped me over. Um, and, and once when, once when that started happening, that's when I started talking to my parents about like, hey, do y'all invest your money? And that's when they told them they had a financial advisor. So now I started looking into that. And that, that was like essentially my, my first real exposure to just like handling money in general. Whenever I actually started to like legit earn money at, and like corporate America, because I, I would work at um, in college, you know, coming up, I work retail, you know, I would work retail mm -hmm. jobs. So I mean, that was a little bit of money. That's still much. You know, I didn't wasn't making enough money to like, OK, now I can I have free money to go and invest in you know, the four, you know, 401k or, or I was basically just making enough to essentially pay my bills and pay my, my, my food and, and kind of keep it moving, man. But uh, yeah, that was probably my first exposure to like actually investing. And, you know, so I, a lot of the research I had to kind of like do on my own or I would have learned about it in school. And then once when it started to apply personally to me, now it's just like I'm taking that next step. So maybe I, I focus on uh, the Intelligent Investor was a great book that I read. Yeah. Um, now, granted, you need a little bit of background knowledge going into an intelligent investor to, to be able to read it. Right. But that, that to me was probably the, the tipping point is like, Oh, okay. Well, I think now I know how to invest. Oh, I'm getting into like life insurance. Cause I have three kids. Right. So right. I don't necessarily invest in life insurance as like an investment per se, but for my three kids and my family, you know, I know how important that is to an overall portfolio. So, you know, I got, you know, life insurance to cover that. I got, my investments in both like 401k and uh, taxable IRA, uh, not taxable, just taxable brokerage accounts. And then, you know, you start to learn a little bit about real estate, right? And so you start getting in, involved into the tax world. So now you're like, that's what, you know, I, I didn't just immediately come out as a tax advisor, right? And you know, I had to get my, my, my interest sparked. I wanted to learn how to file more taxes. So I started reaching out to different uh, mentors that, that, that I knew. Hey, can I kind of file your tax return? I won't even charge you. I just want to like get used to it. Um, and so that's, that's now, now you start learning about real estate investing. You start learning about, oh, I could passively invest in this business, right? And then you start, you start really like getting access to like all sorts of different um, ideas and just experiences. It's a whole world out there that I think a lot of business owners, they just rely on their CPA, hoping that they keep up on everything. And it's hard even for a CPA to keep up on everything. So, I mean, I, I feel like as a small business owner, you've got to take the onus has to be a little bit on you. You've got to pay attention to like all the different things that are out there, or at least be able to ask some questions about it yeah. and, and, and figure out what's going on. But um, I wanted yeah, to hear, yeah. did you, were you pretty set on becoming an accountant, CPA, financial guy, like going, no. you know, when you're in college or it just kind of unfolded? No, yeah, it just kind of unfolded, man. You know, of course, whenever you're young and you're an athlete and you can run kind of fast and you think that you have a chance of going to the pros. Like that was like always my, my initial, sure. like, oh, I want to go pro. And then even after that, I was like, why well, don't go pro? I'm going to be someone's sports, sports agent or I'm going to be someone, some professional's agent. Um, and it didn't work out like that, right? So then mm -hmm. that's when I, I took the corporate America route. 
And, 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 you know, I just got exposed to, to, to what else is all out there. And that's what really like changed my focus. Um, you know, it started off, you know, the whole, the whole tax business really started off in something very small. Um, I didn't think it was going to get as big as what it did. Um, but, uh, you know, once when, it, once when I started, so one of the things that I, that I researched, you know, uh, you know, what, whenever I was first getting started out, what business could I actually go and start? What's when I figured out that like, oh, I could probably own my own business and kind of make more money than what I'm making. What business could I start? Um, and I already knew I was very skilled at, you know, accounting and finance and taxes, but I needed the experience. So that's when I started reaching out to people who I knew at, you know, local firms that, that had, uh, you know, a pretty, pretty decent, uh, you know, a, a sizable number of returns. And I actually would, you know, tell them, hey, can I just, you know, file for free? And so that's how I essentially got my exposure. Got started to get my practice, started to see like different situations. And when I was ready, you know, that's when I started taking off and, and, and trying to do my own return. Start off again, very small. It's not like I just immediately jump right into like, I'm going to be a real estate tax advisor. Like, no, I'm just going to be a tax preparer. Mm -hmm. And then you start to, you know, build connections with different, uh, you know, CPAs and enrolled agents. And then you start finding out like, okay, you can actually niche down and focus on, on this specific sector. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not a bad idea. So you start learning more. And now you're like, okay, well, I don't put my money in there. So now you're getting exposure from not only helping your clients, but also real life exposure. Um, I wanted to step, take a little step back though. Like what was that first like career, corporate career job that you initially took? Like your W2 job, what was that? Yeah, it was, uh, so I worked at a company called Cisco. Cisco Foods oh, yeah. is, uh, yeah. is actually headquarters here in Houston. And I was working okay. in like, it's kind of hard to describe. I would call it their finance accounting tax division it's it's the what i was doing it was called billbacks uh with a, a very cisco generic term it probably doesn't apply to anywhere else but it was very very corporate specific now i didn't learn like great skills when i was there but it was a, you know you know some of like the, the 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 key things that i learned would have been very specific to just all in cisco it wouldn't have applied anywhere else um but I got I got pretty good at what I did there. I had enough free time to like I would just go into work, clock in, clock out, go home. I got all this extra free time. That's where I started to pick up like, okay, hey, what else can I really do? Like, can I invest my money? Oh, hey, maybe I could start this this small business and let me get a little bit of exposure into like how the industry works. But I could probably start off kind of small, keep my W two, and and have a you know a side tax business. But I had no idea it was going to grow as big as what it did. So tonight, you know, eventually I had to just solely only focus on my tax business. Um, and I've just, it's just continued to grow. Now it's to the point where I need to probably start hiring out and having other people come in and help me. Well, I want to get into that a little bit. Like, how did you grow it? Like, at what's, you know, you're in this W2 Cisco job. What stage did you leave that where you felt comfortable to be like, I can give this up. I can go 100% yeah. whole hog into this new, new business. And how did you grow yeah, the man. business? So social media, you know, so, so, so I had started, I had started the journey back in like 2018, 2019 is when I first started that journey. But once when COVID hit and we're at home and it's like, now we really got a lot of time. And that's also when people are now on social media. So I then created a page dedicated solely to just like, I'm going to give people, you know, good tax tips, right? I'm not trying to like, you know, you find all sorts of things on on social media about trying to keep it pretty by the book and just give people ideas and it, it just it just grew you know it didn't grow overnight you know i had to you know consistently post i had to build relationships on uh and my biggest page is actually my instagram but i also you know i'm starting to get a little bit of a follow on twitter as well um i would say like like 85 percent of my clientele comes straight from social media um and so that's that that's basically where I where I essentially I grew the business from, man. And uh do what what uh I, I officially went full time in like twenty twenty one sometime. I can't remember now. That's when I, I first officially started focusing solely on the business. And even when I did that, that's now when I had all my time to focus on I started noticing all these different uh inconsistencies in my business, right? So one of the things I quickly wanted to do is I, I need to take my, I need to like stop touching as much stuff. I need automation. So that, that once when I learned automation, that like opened me up to a whole new realm. Man, there's like so much I've, I've learned in like the, the years that I've been a just man. I wanted to get into that too. Like your tech stack, you know, for a small business person, there's a lot of people that, you know, have a small business that listen to this or want to have a small business. 
What kind of tech stack do you recommend for like somebody, let's say they're a real estate investor or let, let's stick to a real estate investor. What, yeah. What would you say like their tech stack should be? So, so the, the key to a real estate investor is, is definitely going to be, you know, you need to have a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet. Like that's going to be like almost like your compass to doing anything. Um, and most commonly, I think most real estate investors would really like Stessa. Stessa is a, is a bookkeeping software that is really dedicated to real estate investors. However, uh, probably the most common and widely used uh, software out there is going to be QuickBooks. And if you ever need it to hire a bookkeeper, you could probably find someone a lot easier if you already have QuickBooks on versus like, I think they can do you know, some bookkeepers are good at Stessa, but QuickBooks is more widely used. Right, right. Um, talk to me more about like your ideal client right now. Like what, what you're specifically focused on. You said you wanted to niche down. So what, what is that niche that you're going to focus on in your ideal client? Yeah. So, uh, I, I do try to go towards a lot of people that are investing in real estate. I do still work with a lot of small business owners because uh, small business taxes will never go out of style. You always have, you know, that that's the backbone essentially of America is the small business. So. I still do work with small businesses, but I tried to like, you know, once when you start making like, you know, depending on how everything is, but once we start making like five, $10 million or more, I'll probably have to cut it off and like, okay, hey, you know, we're probably getting a little too big for, for what I really want to handle. Cause now you need to start looking at other things like maybe you should be a C Corp or I had you know, th things can get like a little complicated. And unless you have a strategy to like then devote it, you know, maybe take your profits and funnel it over to real estate. I'll probably just hand you off because uh, the real estate in my, in my experience is definitely where a lot of like, you know, whenever you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of potential, you know, tax deductions from things like cost segregation, you can use that to potentially offset your income. That's like right up my alley of like, you know, what I'm very familiar with. Uh, I've studied the passive activity loss audit technique guide and like all the different IRS publications they have out there. So that's just like, you know, whenever you get like more in depth into taxes, uh, you know, there's everyone have a niche, right? So you have like trust taxation, you have maybe you have nonprofit taxation, maybe you want to focus on retirement income. There's all all different niches, and I just happen to really I like the 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 real estate, and then I don't I don't discount my small business owners. So a lot of the people who I work with, high W two that invest in real estate or a high business, and when I say high business, no more than five to ten million. Um, that also invest in real estate. That's going to be my typical client. Now. Let's get into that. The advantages of a, a high W-2 earner married to a real estate, uh, what is it? A real estate professional, REPS, I think it's called. Talk to mm -hmm. me about how people can think about that and like the advantages of it. Yeah, man. No. So, so if you're a high W-2 earner um, and like hands down, like one tax strategy just never goes out of style is you have, you know, one, one spouse is a high W2 earner um, and the other spouse uh, can, can manage rental properties, right? So the idea is that, you know, you're one of qualified for real estate professional, which, which that alone is all nuanced. Like we could probably have an entire topic right. on just real estate professional status, but the, the idea is that you can take the high W2, the, the one spouse can, you know, manage the rental properties, qualify for real estate professional status, that would then unlock any losses that are generated from the property. So now you can do things like cost segregation and bonus depreciation to really draw up that loss and then use that to offset the W-2 income. Um, now, there's like all sorts of different ways this could go because what if you have two spouses and both of them have had hard W-2 incomes? Then that probably takes that strategy off the table, right? right? But now you could look at something like maybe a short-term rental, which is a, there's a special carve out under Section 469 for short-term rentals, and so that's another option that that I, I, I like to look at. But um, yeah, so the, say the more about that. Question. If if it's two W two high two high income W two earners, they buy a short-term Airbnb. Can they then, if they're managing it, doing the day to day? you know, I forget what the percentage is. I, I, I'm not sure, but like if they're doing most of the management of the Airbnb, can they then become a, a real estate professional status? So, so that's a good question, man. And um, so, so the terminology, you know, it, it means everything in like the tax world. So whenever you have an Airbnb, generally 
the average tenant is going to stay for only a few days. Well, the IRS has, uh, they have section 469, which talks about passive activity losses, but they have special exceptions to the rules of what is considered a rental activity. And one of those special carve outs is that the average tenant stays for seven days or less. And if that is true, you don't have a quote unquote rental activity. And so if you don't have a rental activity, you actually don't have to qualify for real estate professional status. Instead, you have more of like an, an, an active business. And in order to treat it as non-passive, you would have to just meet one of the, uh, one of the seven material participation tests. Now, generally, you can meet that test if you manage the property, if you self-manage the property, but you have to document your time and you have to understand which tests are you going to go for because like you said, there's seven of them. You only need to meet one of them, but each one has their own nuance to it. So it's definitely something you want to work with a tax advisor that's very familiar with it um, because you started talking about like, what is material participation? Like what is actually considered active management of the property? And what I always try to tell people is uh, well, I try to go through like what is not considered material participation. And so generally, if you want to sum it up, consider like investor related hours or like travel time. So like driving to and from your properties generally they won't count. And then sitting down and just like reviewing like tax returns and income statements and, uh, you know, bills and things like that generally unless it's part of your day-to-day -day activities of the property, that would be considered investor-related hours and the NERs wouldn't count that. So generally what I like to see is communication with guests, uh, going and maintaining the property. You know, maybe if you had to like fix anything or, 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 or do some re renovations on it uh, prior to like getting it ready, that would be uh, material participation. That's what I like to generally see uh, to qualify for those tests. You had mentioned cost segregation and bonus depreciation. There's a lot of our listeners that have no idea what, what that is. Can you go into that a little bit? Like what is cost segregation and the advantages yeah. of, uh, of that? Yeah, no, no. So, 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 so before we get started, bonus depreciation, depreciation is just a deduction you can claim. Uh, so whenever you have an asset, you say you buy a car in a few years, that car is not going to be as good as what it was when it was brand new because of the wear and tear. The IRS allows you to claim a deduction based on what they generally consider is the wear and tear of an asset over its life. So, for example, a car has a five-year uh, lifespan, depreciable lifespan. Um, now, every asset has a depreciable life. And if it's 20 years or less, it qualifies for bonus depreciation, which is just a way where, okay, if you I probably won't use a car because those are special. But let's just say you have a five-year asset. Generally, you just divide by five. If it's a hundred year, if it's a hundred thousand dollar property, you get twenty thousand dollar deduction every year. But with bonus depreciation, if let's say it's a one hundred percent bonus depreciation, you can get that full deduction up front in year one. That's that's basically what bonus depreciation is. Now, which creates a huge year, loss, right? Which creates a huge loss for the it can, property it or can. potentially, right? Yeah, but 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 here's here's the trick with real estate. So whenever you buy a rental property, rental properties. If they're residential, depreciate at 27 and a half years, and commercial properties are depreciated at 39 years. But when we buy a rental, you're not only buying the structure of the building. You know, sometimes it comes with a parking lot. Maybe it comes with a driveway or a sidewalk or landscaping or furniture or carpeting or lighting. It comes with all these different things that could technically fall under five, seven, or even 15 year property. And that's where the bonus depreciation aspect kind of comes in. And, uh, you know, you can go in, do a cost seg, go and analyze the property and say, like, hey, this is the five-year property. And depending on, like, what the bonus depreciation is that year, in 2024, it's 60%. So if you have, you know, $100,000 of, of, of five-year property, you'll get a $60,000 upfront deduction plus any remaining bonus uh, straight line depreciation after that. Which is huge. I, I talked to, I mentioned Mitchell Baldridge. I had him on the show half a year ago or so, but he said that only about like three to 5% of real estate investors take advantage of cost segregation, which I found shocking. Wow. Yeah, that is shocking. Um, <laughs> you know, you know what? I probably have a work perspective just because I work with, uh, you know, a lot of the clients who I work with, I'm always bringing it up to them. So, you know, the people who I work with are informed, but if I had to put a number on it, that that's really interesting. I, I 
I, I wouldn't be able to tell you if that, if that, you know, what percentage of people know about it and then don't. I would believe it though. I'm definitely not discounting it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's just, uh, it's an interesting thing. And is it something that you typically would recommend to your clients? Like if they own real estate, if they're going to hold on to it, because there is this thing called recapture tax, right? That how do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. Yeah, it, that it, depends. Get, it, it yeah. depends, man. You know, um, a few factors that I would look at, right? So number one, are they in a low tax year? Are they expecting their income to be higher next year, right? That would be one thing that I look at is, okay, if you... If we are going to be able, so I guess the first thing is like, is this going to be a non-passive loss or is this going to be a passive loss? That's probably the very first thing I look at. But then after that, I'm going to say like, okay, if let's just say you can use this loss against your income. Are you in a high tax year or are you going to probably have more income next year? And we probably need to spread out this deduction every few years. And then we also look at exit strategies. How long are you, you know, planning to hold this property? Um, and here's the thing, that that conversation can be tough with people because of course, you talk to someone, they're like, oh, I plan to hold this property until I retire. But then I start talking to them about like how financially of a crunch is it to actually meet the bills and take care of this property. And you quickly find out that, you know, there are a few rentals that absolutely boom with cash flow, but then the majority of them are, are going to be pretty consistent. It's not going to just be boom. And if there comes a hard time, right, what if all of a sudden, People start going on vacation and now you're not meeting your bills. Are you gonna are you gonna sell your property then? That's where people don't understand, right? Yeah. People never see that aspect of things. And so that's where that conversation kind of comes into play is like, okay, if you're gonna do a cost seg, I want you to hold this property for at least, you know, it depends five, six, seven years, you know, before mm -hmm. it actually starts to make sense. Yeah. The reason I found you was you, you did a post on the, all the different tax advantages of real estate that really caught my eye. What are some other ones? We've talked about cost segregation. Are there some other ones that, that you can talk about? Yeah, man. That are great for real estate investors. There, there's a ton of them out there, man. So let's just say that, you know, you, I don't know, let's just say that you're unbelievably profitable with your rentals and you have a hundred thousand dollars of rental profit when it's all said and done. That rental profit is not subject to Social Security and Medicare tax. So if you take someone who has a W-2, yeah, maybe the federal income tax rate is, is about the same, but the W-2 earner is paying Social Security and Medicare, whereas the real estate investor doesn't have those taxes. So like that's a big advantage that I always tell people is that you know you have that passive treatment of rental income. But even after that, right, you know, you start getting into um, if you if you sell a property, you got capital gains. Of course, you do have to worry about depreciation recapture, but here's the cool thing about just depreciation recapture and capital gains in general. Depreciation recapture, I'm not going to say that it is a capital gain because it's not, it's, it's a type of capital gain. It's, it, it'll be recaptured at your ordinary income rates, but tax loss harvesting can actually offset not only capital gains, but also your depreciation recapture. So like there's ways that you can mitigate you know, if you can dispose of a property, you could tax loss harvest against it. Maybe you could do a 1031 exchange. Go, into, go into that a little bit because a lot of people might not know that terminology. What is tax loss harvesting? Yeah. So tax loss harvesting, if you have a capital gain, you know, that's whenever you have an asset, let's just say you got some stocks or bonds or even like a, pre, a rental property. If you buy it at a hundred grand and you sell it for 300 grand, you have a $200,000 capital gain. Now, if you also have stocks in the stock market, it's like a rough year, and maybe you, you sell some stocks at a $150,000 capital loss, you can use that loss to offset some of your capital gain. And that's essentially what tax loss harvesting is. Now, here's the thing. 
a lot of people get caught up in like, oh, well, I should just go invest in some, you know, really bad stock and just draw, draw a loss. I'm like, no, that's not the, the idea. The idea is you have a diversified portfolio. And if you have a diversified portfolio, you're in the US, you're in this market. I'm not a financial advisor. Let me just get that out. So like, don't take my, my advice, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. But the idea is you have a diversified portfolio. And whenever that happens, some of your portfolio is up, some of your portfolio is down. So you could actually use the part that's down, sell that off, and lock in that, that capital loss and use that to offset your capital gain. Got it. Uh, what about a 1031 exchange? You hear that a lot, real estate investors talking about that. Explain what a 1031 exchange is and if you recommend that or not. Yeah, uh, so a 1031 exchange is just essentially a way that a real estate investor can uh, essentially sell their property and then they could use the gains and roll it over into a new property. Now, if you sell a property at 300K, you have to then go you have to basically trade up. So if you sell a property at 300K, you got to go and get a new property that's at least 300K or more in value. Otherwise, if you sell it at 300 and you go and get a new property at 250, you're going to have $50,000 of taxable gain. Now, there's a lot of nuances to like a 1031 exchange. They can be great. I, I do think that um, 1031 exchanges can be great for uh, investors, but there's, like I said, a lot of nuances. Number one, I think probably the biggest uh, mistake I see people make, or not necessarily a mistake, but a uh, uh, misconception is that they can just sell the property, they can take all the money, and they can just roll it over into a new property to qualify. And you actually need a qualified intermediary mm -hmm. to extend, to essentially take that money from you, and they will hold the money, and they'll essentially you know uh, um, continue the, the the transaction for you. But that's like something that I ever across, man. And then if you boil it down to like different states, uh, different states have different clawback rules. So you have to like file those forms with the states every single year. Um, but I could go into like all the details about it, man. But but you and know, you also only have what about you have six months, right, to make yeah the next so you have purchase, which that can bite people in the butt too if they don't haven't identified something and. You yeah, know what and, I'm and 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 it's crazy. So, so whenever you are depending on like when you're trying to do this, right, because. Number one, you never want to tell someone that you're doing a tenth. Besides your qualified intermediary and your tax advisor, don't tell your real estate agent, oh, by the way, I'm doing 10 3 exchange. Because guess what? Now, if they know anything about real estate, they'll know that you are on a time crunch. Yeah. And if you don't think they won't use that to their advantage, they, they certainly will. Right. right. So have some planning involved. Because like you said, you have 45 days to identify. And then of the ones that you identify, you have 180 days to close on them. Um, so you can identify multiple properties if you wanted to, but uh, you can't identify some and then say, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm going to go get someone else and, 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 and buy that one. It doesn't work that way. So that's, that's another new one to keep in mind. Let's get into small business owners and some of the different tax strategies that you recommend your new clients, like, you know, right off the bat, like here's one, two, three. Oh, yeah. You should be doing. Oh, I, I'm big on retirement accounts. You know, mm -hmm. you know, so if, if you're self-employed, you have no employees. I like the solo 401k. I think, I think it's a huge benefit to solopreneurs. Um, and, and, you know, there's also SEP IRA. There's simple IRAs if you have employees, but definitely with retirement accounts. That's like one of the very first things that I look at is like, let's just, I always tell people that, you know, it's not something that you need to take advantage of, but at least you have it in your back pocket. So if you ever want to pull it out and use it, you can do that. Um, and then of course, you know, I'm all about like investing back into the business and like trying to reclaim your time back. So I'm big on hiring employees, like hiring employees or contractors to essentially save you on work time. You can get a tax deduction that way. Um, and then, you know, depending on like the type of employee, you may get credits for, uh, you know, starting up a retirement plan or like whatever the case may be, you know, there's different employee credits that you can get. Uh, but then if you use, uh, Maybe, maybe you have a, a business where you have to use a vehicle a lot for your business. You know, now we start looking into like different vehicle type deductions. And, you know, do you want to get a vehicle that's over 6,000 pounds, that's under 6,000 pounds? Do you even need a vehicle that's... So if it's you know, over 6,000 pounds, what's the advantage of that? So, so whenever, you, whenever you get a, a vehicle, right, you can claim deductions for using a vehicle. There's two ways to go about it. There's the actual method. There's the standard method. The standard method, you just calculate the total business miles and drove, and you multiply by a cent standard rate, boom, that's your deduction. Then there's the actual method where 
you got to go in, you got to still track your miles, but let's just say you use it for 60% business usage. Well, you can deduct 60% of all the, all the um, expenses related to that vehicle, including like gas, uh, tire changes, oil changes, things like that, including depreciation. All right. Now the depreciation is a huge part of like why people go and get vehicles. And the reason why 6,000 pound or greater vehicles are more strategic is the IRS actually allows you to claim more of a depreciation deduction. Well, it's a section 179 expense on heavier vehicles on the 6,000 pounds or more versus if they're under 6,000 pounds. So like that's the big benefit to going after like, yeah, I like F-150s, right? You know, I'm a, yeah. I'm a Texas guy. So F-150s, right. F-250s, that's what I see a lot. But I mean, you got, yeah, there's all sorts of vehicles out there that are 6,000 pounds or more. Right. I wanted to get in, if you have time a little bit, like how you structure your own portfolio. Like how do you invest? I kind of wanted to get into some specifics. Like you talked about insurance a little bit, but I wanted to hear, you talked about, you've got some, since you're self-employed, you've got some 401ks or things like that. How do you, how do you think about investing for yourself? Do you, are you like a active investor? Are you a, an index fund investor? Yeah, I'm pure passive, man. Index funds. I got, I got some bonds also. Yeah. That's, I, I don't know why I got the bonds, but you know, they're not, they're not the best performer. But I got some bonds too. Right. I got the life insurance as like a, as like, I guess I have an investment in some syndications with real estate. So I'm pretty well diversified, but hands down where I probably put most of my investments. So if I were to get, if I were to get $10,000 right now, how would I invest it? I would probably only put maybe $2,000 into like one of those buckets because the other 8,000 is going to go to my business because hands down, the largest ROI that I'm personally seeing right now is actually investing back into my business. And so, yeah, it's kind of hard. You can't really, really quite see like the green number that tells you how much you're up, but I can look at tax returns and I can see like how much more money did I make this year versus last year and go on and so forth. So for me personally, you know, I'm constantly investing into different softwares, different uh, contractors, you know, finding ways to like not only make more money, but then like save time just because, uh, you know, time is very precious. Yeah. Especially now you're in the, the thick of it with uh tax return. So yeah, I really, appre really appreciate your time. Bookkeeping thoughts, like how not to procrastinate on filing taxes. I, I mean, I, I know I'm guilty of this is like just putting off taxes. I dread it. Honestly, like I, yeah. it's just not, it's not administrative stuff is not my thing. Like bookkeeping stuff is not my thing. Stuff just backs up. Like how, what kind of recommendations do you have for small business owners, real estate owners to stay on top of their taxes? Oh man, I would outsource to a, to a bookkeeper. You know, if it's taking up too much of your time, hire someone to take care of it for you. That way you can take that stress off of your plate. Now, one thing, whenever you're looking for a bookkeeper, because you know they have crunch deadlines as well, right? So mm -hmm. they want to get, you know, they have clients that they get their stuff done for because they need to take that information and get it to the tax advisor so that we can get them projections, right? So I would make sure that you have someone who is good at what they do you trust them and then have a good open communication with them. Have quarterly, at least quarterly meetings with them so you can stay up on top of your numbers and just know in the back of your head, okay, this is possibly what I may owe come tax time. So let me start sending some money aside, right? You know, take, take that stress of crunching the numbers and doing the work off of your plate and go get a bookkeeper. If that's something that you want to do, that's fine. Just make sure that you stay on top of your schedule. Maybe, maybe dedicate one day a month to just solely doing your bookkeeping. How would you go about finding a good bookkeeper? Recommendations from other people or how would you go about finding somebody? Yeah, I got some recommendations that I always refer to people, but you just got to ask the right questions. You know, like, you know, do you handle someone that's similar to me? Um, you know, what is your experience with people in my industry? Uh, what is like, your experience in general? Uh, you're gonna have to ask questions. You know, it's, it, that's kind of a, of a tough one, right? Because a lot of times, you know, people will tell you what, whatever you want them to hear. Uh, so sometimes you actually have to like get your feet wet and like actually experience what it's like to work with them, which is kind of like a, which is kind of a drag, you know, because everyone knows what it's like to work with the wrong per person at times. But um, the best you can do is just try to ask the right questions. I know people, whenever they're looking to work with me, they ask me things like, do, you know, do I work with other people in real estate? Have I worked with other, maybe I have like a doctor or a physician. They ask me like, hey, have I ever worked with other physicians? Um, 
And heck, if they're down to give like referrals, like, hey, can you give me a referral of someone who you've worked with? You know, maybe that, you know, some people are okay with it, some people aren't. So, you know, you gotta proceed with caution with that one, but I think it's an option. Yeah. How do you view referrals? I mean, that, that is a, a tricky situation as a, a CPA, you know, like, for example, like cost segregation stuff. Do you, I, I'm just curious in my, my own situation, like, we would like to give people a referral, but how, how do you, how is that viewed? Like in the a referral fee, how is that viewed in, in like the tax preparation world? Is that kind of a no, no, or how is that about like referrals? Yeah. Oh, I, I get referrals all the time. Yeah. No, I don't I'm think talking about probably... you referring, referring, like, let's say, uh, Nick Huber's sweaty startup company, like, and he gives you, you know, a kickback from that. Is that, how, how is that viewed in the industry? Oh, I don't run a, I, I, I found like my general small group of people who I work with. So I always refer them to those same people and, and they, um, if they can't take them, they're very open with them, you know, but I generally give them like four or five contacts. Like, Hey, try these people out. They're all very good. You know, right. generally one of them can work with them. We can go into like books you recommend for whatever, just like finance financial education, knowledge. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, me personally, some of my favorite books, you know, I, I loved intelligent investor. That was like a big one for me. Um, just because, uh, like I said, I had a little bit of background knowledge going, kind of going into it, but intelligent investor was like, uh, I don't know. It just changed my perception on investing in general. Now, as far as books, uh, you know, there's tax strategies for real estate investors. That's a, that's a good book. There, there there's also one out there. It's uh, Tax Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. You know, he's got a good book. Um, but uh, you know, I, I I'm a podcast guy, so you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one of my personal favorites. There's a there's a guy out there uh, named Brandon Hall. He dubbed himself the real estate CPA. He works with a guy named, or I'm not too sure what their working relationship is now, but he used to have a guy named Tom. Uh, Thomas Costello. Yeah, they have a podcast. Was the Tax Smart Real Estate Tax Smart Investors? I can't remember the exact name. It's a really, it's really good though. And right. I like whenever I go on long jogs. You know, I, one of the things I like to do is I like to work out, and I'll go on like a four or five mile jog, and I'll just put on their podcast, and I'll just listen to what they got to say. Great, great podcast. I'm, I really like their stuff. I'll um, check it out, and we can put some my, links my, to the show notes. I also got a buddy named Ryan Bake. Ryan Bake. I mean, I can't remember the name. Real Estate CPA podcast. I can't remember. I can't remember the names of their podcasts, but he's got a really good. Uh, he's got a lot of good information as well. And so, especially for my real estate investors, check out both of those. Um, Brandon Hall, Thomas Caselli, and Ryan Bakey. They have they put out really great content. Yeah, there's so much great stuff out there, and like that that is the fortunate thing today with like podcasts. And there's so much information out there that you can get for free and really kind of stay up to date on stuff. It's really a smart thing to do. So I wanted to get into some of the biggest mistakes. You're right in the middle of tax season right now. Stressful time for everybody, but I wanted to talk about just the biggest mistakes you see small business people make, real estate investors make. What are some of the things that you see that could easily be avoided? Yeah, man, there's, I see all sorts of different ones, man, but uh, and I guess it depends on like what level they're on. But, you know, if you want to talk about like fundamental mistakes, that bookkeeping, you know, I don't know how often I run across people that co-mingle their personal and their business expenses. And, uh, man, it just makes it very difficult. It's very, very easy to let expenses slip through the cracks that way. So hands down, that's probably like, you know, whenever we talk about the basics, that's one of the most common mistakes I see, man. Um, other than that, you know, uh, so when I, whenever I like work with people, you know, especially if, if I've worked with them previously, I like to look at all the documents you gave me the previous year. And then now the following year, if you don't give me those documents, I'm going to be asking about them. And I mean, all the time, you know, people just, it's a lot of tax forms, right? So it's easy to forget, but that would be another one, right? Just simply forgetting tax documents that are sent to you. Like that happens all the time, man. But it's also, there's a lot of misconceptions, right? Because uh, you know, so, so for example, the whole vehicle, we were talking about the vehicle deduction a little bit earlier, but essentially, man, a lot of people just have this misconception that they can just go and buy a vehicle and then like they can, all right, I'm going to get a tax write off, but they don't realize all of the documentation that, that kind of like goes into it. So that would be like another misconception. A lot of people think like, 
I got this $50,000 vehicle, so I'm going to save $50,000 in taxes and don't even realize that they're not going to get 50K in taxes. They'll get maybe, what, 10 to 15, maybe maybe if they're lucky, 20K in tax, you know, tax savings. So mm-hmm. it's a lot of misconceptions and then a lot of mistakes that I see. So it's like a combination of two create a perfect storm. Yeah. Yeah. I also wanted to touch a little on, you said that the best way you, that you've grown your practice is through social media, through Twitter. Sounded like Instagram was like more your focus, but you're also focusing on, on on Twitter. Talk to me a little bit about somebody who is listening to this, who's trying to just get on Twitter and start providing value. Like, what did you do? Who did you copy? Who did you study? Things like that. Yeah, man. Um, you know, the the biggest thing is just put out valuable content. You know, he doesn't have to. You know, of course, it's always great to hit him with that wow factor, but you know, sometimes people just need to know you know, the basics, like, Hey, uh, you know, don't forget to separate your business and personal bank accounts. I mean, that, that right there is a ton of value for someone who's not even doing it. Right. So get out there, um, you know, put out good content, just go in there looking to improve other people's, uh, situation. So whenever I initially started, a lot of people get like on social media and they're like, they're constantly trying to sell themselves. Like, Hey, sign up for my servers. Hey, do this, do that. You know, I rarely ever ask, people to sign up for my service. I provide value, provide value, provide value. You know, hey, here's an example. Hey, here's value. And yet every now and then, once when I've like really built up that trust and, you know, now they've, they've seen me provide good content multiple times. Oh, hey, by the way, did you know I'm still accepting clients or, you know, hey, we have like three spots left or something like that. So that's usually the way I go about it is don't, don't create a social media page to try to sell yourself. Sell yourself, but by, but do it by providing value. People will learn to trust you whenever you provide good, useful content, and that's you know that's how you get you know clientele off of like social media is constantly providing good value. So I mean, is that are you doing any kind of customer outreach other than that? Or are you relying strictly on social media to to bring in clients? Yeah, man, I'm actually turning people away at this point, man. So yeah, so I mean, that's every great. now and then. Uh, you get referrals. So like you work with someone and they really like you. They're usually, they, they, they have a, you know, a group who they you know work with. So they'll, they'll, you know, start referring some of the people that they know, but um, even then, you know, they refer them and they go and they check out my social media. Then they end up reaching out to me on, on social media somehow. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't do any direct con- you know, customer outreach. It's, it's almost solely, uh, now it's basically solely just social media or, you know, referrals or people who I've worked with previously. That's awesome. I mean, it's true. Like the, the best marketing is just word of mouth. Like people telling each other about your, what you do and like, Hey, this guy does a great job for me. I'm really happy with him. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I wanted to hear like when you are first onboarding somebody, like, what does that look like? They reach out to you on social media. They say, Hey, Grant, you know, I want to, I need a new accountant. I'm not happy with my old guy or, or whatever. I'm just looking to, I've never used an accountant before. Talk to me about like the onboarding process, the questions you ask them, things like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, usually I start off with like a free call, you know, just get on a, you know, it's a free discovery call. Just kind of like talk, you know, see if we even can be a good fit. So, um, I do look for indicators, right? Because I only want to work with people who I actually, you know, would like to enjoy work with, man. So, Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll ask them about their previous tax uh, advisor. You know, I'll listen very carefully. Like I, I try to listen to what people say and take that and improve my skills. But if I quickly, if too many red flags start to pop up, you know, that that would be like an indicator of like, all right, maybe maybe I should start cheer, during this, this this conversation towards like, hey, we're kind of booked up right now. I don't know if we can take you on. But um, you know, I, I'll ask them questions like, hey, have you? Uh, work with the tax advisor before. What was your experience? What did you like about them? What did you dislike about them? You know, you can tell a stand up person by the way how they give you a response to what they didn't like about a person, right? Because it'll still somewhat be positive, maybe a little constructive criticism, but a red flag for me would be someone, you know, I mean, there's, it's just the way how they go about it. It's just, you know, it's kind of hard to describe. There's a way how you can kind of tell, like, ooh, they seem a little, uh, uh, unrealistic, uh, you know, mm-hmm. with, with their expectation a little bit. So that that's something that I'll look for. But then I start to talk to them, you know, like I'm really trying to gear in towards more of that real estate investing. So I I tell them, you know, I I don't I don't really like keep you know hide anything from them. I always tell them like, hey, you know, I could help you 
you know, set up the, the foundation and get your, your 401k and like make sure that we optimize business deductions. But if you really want to get the most value out of me, you're probably going to want to like start investing in real estate. Start at least consider it and just hear what I have to say, because hands down, when it comes to tax savings, that's usually like my route to go. Other people don't need that. Some, some, sometimes people just want to know like, hey, how much am I going to owe? Like, I just want someone to contact so that whenever I need an estimate, I can just run you the numbers. You can just tell me, hey, I'm going to owe 10 grand or whatever the case may be. Right, right. So you said you were talking about ramping up and 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 growing the practice. What will be your first hire? I'm curious, like, when you think about your first hire, who who would that be? Yeah, so I actually have... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny you ask, man. So the, there's so many different thoughts that go through my head. But right now I have a lot of administrative work. So I would want to hire someone who could take on avenue work, but I'm really looking for maybe someone who's like fresh out of school in college that has somewhat of a background in business and finance or accounting. Because yeah, the admin work will be easy, but now I can start introducing them to like, hey, why don't you try filling out this W-2 tax form for me? Like, just, just show me how, how it works. Um, and, and, and then slowly try to build them up into like another specialist. So like I would consider myself a specialist. I would want to get someone who handles the admin, but essentially they would be another specialist. Got it. Got it. So are you in the interviewing process now? Is that, is that coming up maybe next tax season? Yeah. So really, I'm trying to get them onboarded by the summer so that I can take care of them. Because, you know, the busy season is for tax prep. Uh, January through April is absolutely like crazy, right? But then it slows down in the summer. And then we get into now the extension deadline, September, August, September, October, right? I want to kind of gear them up and get them ready for that, that September, October to a busy season because it's busy, but it's not as crazy. Um, but you know, that, that's in the, that way, whenever I get them for the January through April, now they're like, you know, they're, they're primed and ready to go. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I can imagine this time of year for you is just busy. So I, I really do appreciate your time. I wanted yeah. to last touch on cryptocurrency stuff. So like people that are trading, let's say maybe Bitcoin or these alt altcoins on Coinbase or whatever. How do you recommend people to keep track of that? Like I used to do that in 2017 and got totally burned you know, in terms of my losses. I, mean, yeah. I swore off of it. But, you know, there are people obviously that are doing it. What do you recommend in terms of keeping track of all of that? Yeah, um, you know, you, you want to keep a, a, some type of like uh, software, like like a coin tracker or coin ledger or something like that to help track your basis and your total proceeds from whenever you're like exchanging crypto. So high level, most of the time if you're trading crypto, it's going to be, it's going to trigger short term or long term capital gains. Uh, one little caveat is that the wash sale rule actually does not apply to crypto. So you don't really need to be mindful of that. Um, so explain that. So for, for people that don't know what the wash sale rule is. Essentially what it is, is, you know, if you sell a security at a loss, you cannot turn around and buy that same security within like 30 days or something like that. Otherwise, that loss can no longer be used to offset your income, but that loss doesn't go away. What ends up happening, it gets added to your overall cost basis on whenever you repurchase the stock. So um, tax loss harvesting, if that's a strategy, we were talking a little bit about that earlier. If you're going to tax yeah. loss harvest, you want to be mindful of the wash sale loss rule, but that does not apply to crypto. Lastly, I wanted to ask you, you're a married guy. You've got kids. How do you guys manage your own finances at home with you and your wife? Like, I'm, I'm, I just got married about a year and a half ago, so we're blending our finances and that's a challenge. And I just kind of wanted to hear some of your tips that you have for yeah, um, couples working together. We we have joint accounts, but um, so I, I'm I'm the only source of income in the household. So a lot of the income it comes in through the business, and then it, you know that's where most of the income is, and then I kind of trickle that out to the personal accounts. Um, now where most of the bills, I mean, we have access like it's all joint accounts, so she can get in there whenever she wants. But I do have her own. I call it her account, but it's still a joint account, so like we can still go in and access it, but. Yeah. I have the money transferred from the business over to like our big main joint account where like the mortgage and stuff gets paid. And then she has her own personal account that I'll, I'll transfer like maybe like a thousand dollars a month over there. It's where she can just go over like freely spend. It. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. This has been fun, Grant. I really appreciate your time. Um, anything you wanted to touch on that we didn't get a chance to talk about? 
Man, there's there, there's so much, man. I feel like we could have like talked all day about like real estate. Oh, one thing, man, you know, so so we talked a lot about real estate and like using the non-passive losses to offset your income. But one idea out there for everyone who may not be into the whole non-passive uh, option, because again, real estate is going to be a passive activity, generate passive losses. And so a lot of people are like, oh, what am I going to do with these passive losses? Well, maybe shift your mindset a little bit, try to find like a service business. So like, for example, I have a buddy, he owns a dog poop street business and it's just like <laughs> absolutely killer way, right? But if you would have, what if you would have been an investor in, in his dog poop street business, he needs some more trucks to like hire out. So he needs funding. And you get a 25% share, of, 25 share of his profits. Well, that profit is all passive income. And now if you have rentals, you can use those passive losses to offset that passive income. You can build up a portfolio of passive businesses and passive rentals. So there's all so many different routes that we could go with the real estate, man. But, uh, uh -huh. you know, that's, that's just one little tip, you know, right as we, you know, are, are wrapping everything up. Yeah, there's so much out there. And it's just, again, I think you just, you got to stay on top of all this stuff and learn about it, read about it, study about it. You, you're providing great content on Twitter. You know, I, I just think like looking at, people's profiles like yours, you can learn a ton. So it's just like staying on top of it. But um, where could people find out about you? We've talked about your Twitter account, but how could they reach out to you and, and get in touch with you? Yeah, um, you can find me on Instagram at Doherty Tax Solutions. On Twitter, it's D-O-U Tax Solutions. Twitter has that like that handle that you can't go past. Um, and then you could also just always reach out to me via email at DohertyTaxSolutions at gmail.com. Awesome. Grant, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Hey, man, thanks again for having me on. All right. The key is here, we need a system where you can be average and still win. And so I think about my portfolio as basically dollar cost averaging um, every 18 months in real estate. Sometimes I will buy high um, at the wrong point in the, the cycle, and sometimes I'll buy low. And it's really hard to know that. And everyone wants to predict um, the market cycle uh, in that context. But I think first and foremost, it's I believe in that long-term th thesis, and I'm going to buy consistently when my position can afford it. I'm never gonna put myself in a position where I'm dependent on the property working out to move my financial position forward.